This is RTV6 News at 7, working for you. Good evening, I'm Mark Mullins, and thanks for being here with us at 7 o'clock. As you get your weekend started, we want to find out how long this heat is going to stick around. Storm Team 6 meteorologist Kyle Mounts has a look at your evening forecast. Hey, Kyle. And Mark, we almost hit 90 degrees again today, and it is the 12th day in a row that we've made it to 80 or warmer. It looks like we're going to add on a couple more 80-degree days here as we go into the upcoming weekend. Right now, that thermometer is sitting at 83. We've got quite a bit of sunshine across central Indiana, and that southwest breeze has been bringing in a little more more humidity, so that gives that feels like number a couple of extra degrees over the thermometer. Feels like 85 in downtown, feels like 87 for you in Muncie, and that temperature 83 is what it feels like in Columbus. Satellite and radar fairly quiet. Now we have had a few isolated downpours here, especially over Greene County and near the Spencer area, but you can see those have quickly fallen apart. I would say our rain chance for the rest of the evening is about 10% or less. So the majority of us staying dry here, those temperatures sliding back into the 70s. 75 degrees by 11 o'clock with partly cloudy skies. RTV6 is digging into a problem that's holding up part of Muncie, making people late for work and school and keeping first responders from getting to emergencies. Trains are stopping, blocking busy intersections on streets like McGalliard, Tillotson, Batavia and White River Boulevard. Emergency vehicles have had to search for alternate routes, and the Muncie Fire Department is placing three ambulances in areas impacted most by these stopped trains. It's a huge disturbance for people trying to get to work, people trying to do different things throughout their daily life. But for us, it could be life or death. School bus drivers often have to notify school principals that dozens of students will be late when they get held up by a train. RTV6 learned Norfolk Southern Railways operates the trains blocking the busiest streets. The company has not yet responded to our questions, but the city says it's looking into writing tickets for the stopped trains. An Indianapolis man involved in a fight with two off-duty IMPD officers five years ago has been awarded more than a million dollars from a federal jury. Bradford Bahannon sued the two former officers and the city of Indianapolis in 2017 in federal civil court after the officers were found not guilty in a criminal trial. Neither officer is currently with IMPD. The jury found that the two officers' use of force was caused by Indianapolis's policies, and Bahannon was awarded $1.2 million from the city. An IMPD spokesperson said the department has been updating its policies over the past few years to make sure appropriate action is taken. An Indianapolis woman says her life will never be the same after falling off an electric scooter. Paula Spear suffered a traumatic brain injury after she says she was thrown from a Lime scooter back in June. She was riding with friends and not wearing a helmet when Paula says that she was thrown forward onto the pavement. Paula and her husband filed a federal lawsuit on September 19th against Lime's operator and manufacturer, Neutron Holdings, Nine Bot, and Segway. They allege the scooters are defective because they're unstable and the accelerator sticks. Paula says the company's also failed to label the scooter with warnings or provide instructions about proper use. That you assume that they're safe, but, but they're not necessarily safe. Um, because what happened to me um, could happen to anybody any age. Um, so... We would just would like people to be aware of that so this same thing doesn't happen to anyone else. The Spears are asking a federal judge to issue a judgment to compensate them for the injuries and other damages they've experienced. Lime Scooters, as their cities throughout Indiana, they include Bloomington, Elkhart, and South Bend. The company says while they can't comment on active litigation, the safety of their riders and community is their highest priority. Today, a retail giant is promising to stop selling e-cigarettes as the nation sees more and more deaths tied to vaping. Walmart says it plans to discontinue sales of electronic nicotine delivery products at all of its U.S. locations and all Sam's Clubs, too. The decision from America's largest retailer could influence other stores, marking a significant blow against the vaping industry. The U.S. saw its eighth death from lung disease tied to vaping yesterday in Missouri. There is one confirmed vaping-related death here in Indiana. The Indiana Department of Health is investigating getting 34 respiratory illnesses connected to electronic cigarettes. Staggering numbers backed by the federal government show one in nine 12th graders are now vaping regularly. As Annie Taylor reports, one mom is speaking up about what vaping has done to her teen and how pediatricians are unequipped to help kids out. I have a son who 
started vaping at about um, 14 or 15 years old. When mother and nurse Kristen Boparlin found out about her son Cade's vaping addiction, I feared for his life. She sprang into action and went right to her son's pediatrician. Initially, it was a little bit of a struggle. I think on the local level, um, pediatricians um, more out in the rural, rural areas um, are still struggling with how to treat these kids. Her son's pediatrician would not prescribe traditional nicotine addiction treatments for her son. The nicotine replacement therapy, um, for example, gums and patches aren't FDA approved for children. Dr. Ahmad Rashid, a pulmonologist with Swedish Medical Center in Denver, understands why doctors may be hesitant. We physicians are very, um, you know, tuned to following rigorous protocols. And sometimes if a protocol is not available, you kind of hesitate a little bit. Children dealing with e-cigarette addiction is a newer problem and also a big one. About 20% of the high school students use e-cigarettes. Um, and that's a huge number. And more evidence keeps coming out about how bad they are for you. In more serious cases, it can lead to your lungs getting basically bogged down by inflammation and causing respiratory failure. Bo Parlin found out how scary it can be when her son got really sick. There was one winter that I think he ended up with mono pneumonia and the flu all within a few months of each other. His cough kept getting worse and it scared her. Her son was eventually diagnosed with restrictive lung disease. The restrictive lung disease was pretty impactful. Um, you know, he had hopes of playing hockey and in college. Bo Parlin found a doctor who was willing to help, but her son is no longer able to participate in sports. Are his lungs so compromised that he's not gonna be able to fight it off and he's gonna be the next kid in the hospital. As she looks ahead to her son's future, she has so many unanswered questions. Annie Taylor with that report tonight. Today, we are hearing from the Indiana Attorney General on the investigation into the thousands of remains found on properties belonging to a former Indiana abortion doctor. 2,200 fetal remains were found in the Illinois home of Dr. Ulrich Klopfer after he died earlier this month. He operated clinics in Gary, South Bend, and Fort Wayne. Today, Attorney General Curtis Hill addressed the case of Dr. Klopfer, whose clinic had lost its license in 2016 following an investigation. At a record, of deplorable conditions and violations of regulatory controls that are placed on these clinics. Uh, he certainly was problematic in life, and as it turns out, continues to pre present problems in his death. Thursday, police in Illinois talked about the case for the first time, saying they have not found any evidence that medical procedures happened at the home, and they don't know why remains were stored there. The people united will never be divided. That's the sound of some very passionate young people who are trying to keep the planet healthy for themselves and their descendants. Local students walked out of class today as they took part in the global climate strike. They rallied at the state house to demand action to end dependency on fossil fuels and for lawmakers to pass the Green New Deal. The crowds were strong here in the streets of Indianapolis and even stronger in larger cities like New York, which you see behind me here. The New York City Mayor's Office estimated this crowd at 60,000 strong. Students from all over the world walked out of class today to call for immediate action on climate change. Many school districts endorsed and even encouraged the students. A huge crowd gathered in Washington, D.C. near the National Mall and marched to the U.S. Capitol. World leaders will meet on Monday at the U.N. for the Climate Summit. A late night rescue at the happiest place on earth. The tools emergency crews use to rescue dozens from a Disney World monorail. And we've got those temperatures in the 80s, but there's some signs that we're going to get a break in this heat. I'll let you know when it's finally going to feel like fall. You're watching RTV6 News at 7. Only on RTV6 News. This is RTV6 News at 7, working for you. Tonight, floodwaters are slowly receding from the Houston area, and we're getting a better look at the damage left behind. Tropical storm Imelda dumped a massive amount of rain on South Texas over three days. Tow truck drivers are now working to remove hundreds of abandoned cars. Drivers had to leave them when roads and highways turned into raging rivers. At least one person died trying to drive through a flooded intersection. And I tell you what, the Houston area just can't seem to catch a break with these roll through. The flooding is tremendous. Yeah, yeah the tropical 
systems that they've had to deal with here over the last several years. The good news with that one, it is starting to move, the heaviest rain moving out of that area. We do have some rain chances as we go into the upcoming weekend, and we've had a couple of isolated downpours out there this evening, but Storm Team 6 radar, things are really pretty quiet. Any of those showers have really been confined a little closer to Sullivan, into the Greenfield area, and also around Spencer earlier this evening. We got hazy sunshine out there. Those temperatures generally in the 80s, some of that rain influenced cooled air, not necessarily that it is rained in Bloomington, but that cooler air moving in at 76 will be to 67 for that overnight temperature with partly cloudy skies. Again, any additional rain this evening would be very minimal and isolated. Here's Truecast as we go into tomorrow morning. We will have some clouds around, temperatures in the 60s, but we warm pretty quickly here. A mix of sun and clouds through the day, 84 degrees at 330 in the city. You notice some rain back in Illinois, still not quite going to make it here into central Indiana. Temperatures, though, they continue to warm. 86 in Lafayette, Danville, 87 tomorrow afternoon in Rushville. And again, it'll feel a degree or two warmer than that with the humidity. So, of course, you're going to need to stay hydrated if you're heading out to the IU game here in Memorial Stadium. We've got our temperature 82 degrees for the kickoff there. Mostly sunny skies will be a little breezy as we go through the game. So Sunday, much of the day is going to be dry. Here's a look at Truecast, though, as we go to 630 in the evening, scattered showers, a few thunderstorms. Those will continue to slide south and east across the area. And as they move through, could produce about a half to an inch of rainfall. Also, that marginal risk, a couple of those storms could have some gusty winds as well. Seven day planning forecast. We put it all together for you. And there are those highs the next couple of days in the middle 80s. But then fall arrives on Monday. So do the cooler temperatures. 76 the afternoon high. We're into the 50s to start off Tuesday and Wednesday. Highs will stay pretty comfortable, a little more seasonal, but the 80s are not finished. They are back next Friday. Oh, they're like, hey, we are back. <laughs> Hold on. All right, thanks, Kyle, for that. A fun day at Disney World came to a screeching halt last night. Fire crews had to rescue Disney fans from the monorail after it broke down on its way to Epcot Center around 10.30 p.m. As many as 100 people were on board when this happened. Fire crews used a ladder truck to bring them down one by one. Three people were treated for minor issues, one for an asthma attack, one for an anxiety attack, and another for nausea. Disney has not yet said exactly what went wrong with the monorail. Coming up in Hiring Hoosiers, these students are cleaning up when it comes to getting training for their future careers, how this program gets them ready for the real world. Plus, that camera on your front door can be great for protection or solving crimes, but the growing use of home surveillance is raising questions about your privacy. That story's still ahead. Mantra. Visit your local Hyundai dealer today. RTV 6's Hiring Hoosiers connects you with stories of skills, resources, employment, and education. The phrase, go clean your room, is nothing for some students at Newcastle Career Center. They are going above and beyond at keeping the entire school in tip-top shape. Looking into Newcastle's facility maintenance program, our Aaron List shows us how they're getting classroom to career ready, one cleaning supply at a time. Students clean the Newcastle Fieldhouse from top to bottom, making this place look great for the thousands of fans that will fill these bleachers. And the great thing is they enjoy what they're doing in the facility maintenance program. Digging through the mulch, students make Newcastle Career Center look good, which makes them feel good. I, I feel really accomplished. I feel like I'm actually doing something good that will help make this school look like it deserves to be here. They experience the daily care in and outside of the buildings. Some students say they're unclear about their career path, but facility maintenance has sparked their interest. Uh, not yet. I'm still working on it, and I'm hoping this program will help me decide on what I want to do. Instructors say this all-inclusive program is open to students with special needs. You know, they're like everybody else. They, they, they want to be successful. They want to thrive, you know, and they want to go out and get a job someday like everyone else. They work on advanced floor care, basic cleaning procedures, how to use sanitation and hazardous materials, as well as work in different facilities in the community. They, they, they go to school here and then they leave here and they work in the community. So, you know, I think it's important that we, you know, we do everything we can to kind of give them the skills they need and the opportunities to, you know, to succeed. As they sand the walls, clean the floors, and plant new landscape, they will take these skills and use them for future careers. It's really satisfying to see hard work pay off, and it makes my life a little bit more fun and interesting. In Newcastle, Aaron Lish, RTV6. 
Well, ring doorbell cameras allow people to monitor their property and share the video with neighbors. And now that video is being shared with hundreds of police departments too. Kai Beach is looking into how this is raising new questions about technology and privacy. A man lurking in someone else's garage, then swinging this pickaxe, trying to break down a door. And it's all caught on camera by this ring security system. I got freaked out. I was really, really upset. This crime happened at Debbie Vandry's home. That is the lovely pickaxe that he took out of the closet. I'm hoping he gets to spend a lot of time in jail. She has a ring system set up to the neighbor's app so that local police can access the video and use it as evidence. I think it's awesome. I think it's absolutely awesome. We all share on next door anyway. Now if we can all share on Ring, it brings us closer to home. After being sold to Amazon for nearly $800 million, Ring recently announced partnerships with more than 400 police departments across the country. Hey bud, the police are on the way. This allows officers easy access to footage when a crime happens. But now some are expressing concerns over privacy issues. Tech can be used for good and for ill. Steve Beatty, a computer science professor at MSU Denver, owns a ring camera. But he's skeptical of how the security cameras will work with police departments in the future. How comfortable are we having, for example, our children or ourselves being tagged as suspicious in the neighbor's house? Get away from the door. How comfortable are, are we going to be with it when it goes to facial recognition, which is certainly an obvious next step. We asked Ring those questions and they sent a statement saying in part, hey. Ring does not use facial recognition. Hey. Law enforcement must go through the Ring team when making a video request. Hey, put that back. And law enforcement are never given access to users' cameras or devices through the neighbor's portal or by Ring. Castle Rock, Colorado police work with Ring and are now addressing privacy concerns head on. Sure, I can understand why people might be fearful of that. However, with our system, there's, there's no Big Brother aspect. We have zero direct access to anybody's camera. Officer Dan Moffitt says Castle Rock PD works with about 360 residents who have registered their cameras with the department. It's a voluntary partnership with us. We request the video through them and they send it to us if they have anything. Um, other than that, there's uh, using the Rockwatch platform, there's no way that a police officer will ever directly view your camera footage unless you show it to him. But a United States lawmaker isn't buying it and he wants more information. Massachusetts Senator Edward J. Markey is calling out Amazon CEO Jeffrey Bezos for what he says are civil liberty issues, sending the new owner of Ring a laundry list of questions ranging from security requirements to racial profiling. So this is our Ring doorbell camera. Cybersecurity expert Steve Fox of Security Pursuit is a longtime Ring user, but he's not opting into the Ring neighborhood system. It always, to me, comes back to that quintessential argument of uh, personal privacy versus public safety. I like supporting public safety efforts, uh, but I value my own privacy. Personal privacy. Hey, hey. Something Vandry hey, believes was lost a long time ago. I think we lost our privacy when the internet came out. Um. <laughs> Now she fully supports Ring partnering with police. I'm all for it, 100% for it. Put me out there. Hey, you can put it down, dude. I want to help somebody to stay safe. Put it back. I'm Kai Beach reporting. Well, still ahead, we hate to tell you, but there's another set of interstate closures you need to know about for next week. That alert plus a final check of your forecast next right here on RTV6. An RTV6 traffic alert right now. You need to know about this closure heading into next week. The Indiana Department of Transportation will close four downtown Meridian Street interstate ramps beginning Monday at 4 a.m. Crews say they will be repairing winter damage. The closures include the ramp from westbound I-70 to Meridian Street, the ramp from eastbound I-70 to Meridian, the ramp from Meridian to westbound I-70, and from Meridian to eastbound I-70. Again, these closures begin Monday at 4 a.m. and continue through next Friday morning might want to find alternate routes. A tiny town near Area 51 is preparing for an invasion and hoping visitors come in peace. This all started with a viral Facebook invitation to storm Area 51 on September 20th. Well, more than 2 million people responded. The organizers have now put together a three-day music festival, but they just don't know how many people will actually show up. The town doesn't have a gas station or a grocery store, and right now they're just hoping for enough 
porta potty, so that can turn very <laughs> ugly in the desert very quickly. Yeah, and very uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, it's been pretty warm out there in central Indiana. We're going to hold on to that here the next couple of days. So if you've got some outdoor plans this weekend, highs in the middle to upper 80s and lots of dry time out there. You notice that chance for showers and storms, though, Sunday evening. There is that marginal threat across much of central Indiana Sunday night that we could have some gusty winds and a few of those storms, but it'll also bring some beneficial rain to the area and a break in the heat. And that seven-day planning forecast, fall officially arrives early Monday morning. It'll feel like it by the afternoon at 76. Here it comes. We're back with you tonight for RTV6 News at 11. Until then, have a great evening, everybody.